is the hardest thing to deal with in counseling, helping people. And the first mention of it is in Exodus, and the uh, background to this is the Israelites had gone through the Red Sea, and God brought them all through the Red Sea, saved all the Israelites, drowned the Egyptians, and then they got to the far side and they broke out in spontaneous praise and adoration to the Lord God. So we want to go back to that and we're going to read about that. Okay, I'll just read it. <laughs> you want to see it on the screen. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. I guess we'll have to. Yeah. Okay. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God. I will exalt him. My Father's God. And I will praise him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. And in the greatness of your excellency, you have overthrown those who rose up against you. So they sang and they exalted the Lord God like we did here this morning. Can you imagine two million people being there, worshiping and praising for what God had just done? They sang about him, about his triumph. They expressed who he was to them. They described him, a man of war, self-existing, glorious in power. They focused on him in the greatness of his excellency. Now that word excellency in that verse is the same word that's in Proverbs and it goes like this. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That word excellency and that word pride are exactly the same words in the original language. Exactly the same word. Thank you for doing that. Let's see if we can find it here. Okay, we just read that. Excellency means to lift up, to exalt, to focus on. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before the fall. So those two words are exactly the same word in the original language. So when we focus on and we worship the Lord God, God calls that excellency. When we focus on and build up ourselves, same word, God calls it pride. And pride is when we exalt ourselves, focus on me. Pride is where I control somebody else. My opinions, my desires, my thoughts are primary. I have become central. Everything revolves around me. The Bible has terms to describe a prideful person, selfish, boastful, haughty, high-minded, arrogant, conceited, an exaggerated opinion of oneself. If you look at the whole thing of pride, basically it's a self-focus. It's a focus on me. That's pride. Let's look at the origin of pride. Here's a, a, a diagram that illustrates that uh, History is divided up into three 2,000 year periods. And the first thing that God created was, was angels. And uh, one of those angels was Lucifer. And that's the origin of pride. Let's read about him in Isaiah. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mountain, on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest 
depths of the pit. And that's what happened to Lucifer, and he was sentenced, his name is changed to Satan, and that's the origin of pride. There was no pride until Satan came along and rebelled against God. He just wanted to be independent of God. That's pride. You know, if you look at the Word of God, the whole theme, or one of the great themes in here is to worship the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor is yourself. I would have thought the Satanic Bible would be the opposite. There is a Satanic Bible. If you go to a Satanic church, you'll, you'll find one. I've never seen a Satanic Bible. I wouldn't touch it if I saw it. <laughs> But I understand from those that have read the Satanic Bible, I would have thought there'd be all kinds of admonitions to worshiping Satan, to giving him homage, to, to focus on him. There's not one reference I understand in the Satanic Bible to focusing on Satan. The whole tenor of the Satanic Bible, whatever you want to do, do it. It's all about you. Deny yourself no pleasure. Life revolves around you. That's what pride is all about. When you start looking at pride that way, we realize this pride is about as satanic as you can get. Well, how does pride manifest itself? We live in a, a, a me-oriented society, and a lot of Christian books will even talk about you and how God relates to you instead of how how do we fit into God's program no it's always how does God fit into my life so what's he doing pride affects our speech our attitudes our decisions our priorities our ministries someone said God could do amazing things in a church if nobody cared who gets the credit Pride affects relationships. I remember one time I had a couple in, and their, probably their biggest problem they were dealing with was, was this whole pride area. And I was helping them with it all week, and they were, they were just kind of fighting it. And uh, finally, we had about one hour, I take couples for a week at a time, so we spent 15 hours a week solving the root issues. We got to the last hour. Finally, he just kind of pushed his chair back and he says, you know what, I'm not doing one more thing here until she, and he gave her a list of things she had to change. And she says, oh yeah? Well, I'm not doing one more thing until you. And he gave her, she gave him a list of things. <laughs> so I just kind of pushed my chair back. <laughs> and I said, and I only said this to get their attention. I said, you guys might as well get a divorce. And I didn't say anything more. <laughs> I never think that's the answer, okay? We put marriages together, we don't encourage divorce or anything. No. I wanted to get their attention, so I didn't say anything else. And finally, and they came actually thousands of miles. Do we came all this way for you to tell us we need a divorce? I says, well, what you've done is you set up an impossible situation. You said, you're not going to do anything until she, and you're not going to do anything until he. Somebody has to humble themselves. Somebody has to humble themselves. And they still refused. You know, I remember myself when I was in Bible college. I, I had some struggles toward the end of my teens and, and I got that kind of settled and everything, I really got my heart right with God on some issues and everything was good. My, I mean, my life was just about perfect. <laughs> and no problems. And then I got married. And then I realized how utterly and horribly selfish and self-focused and prideful I really was so when I talk about this issue I'm not preaching at you <laughs> I'm talking to me too so let's look at it together 
There are consequences for everything that we do, good or bad. We talked about that this weekend. What are some of the consequences of pride? Well, it brings destruction. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud. We see how destructive it was for Lucifer. We see how destructive it was for Adam and Eve this week. I will destroy the house of the proud. I have a very good friend that I watched his home crumble because he wouldn't humble himself. This is true. It brings distance from God. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Oftentimes when I'm leading a person in prayer, helping them deal with some pain issues, Sometimes they just can't connect. They're believers, yes, they put their trust in Jesus as their Savior, but they can't connect at a heart level. And sometimes it's pride that gets in there and blocks that. God knows the distance, or the proud from a distance. Pride brings disgrace. When pride comes, then comes shame. But with the humble is wisdom. There are two movies out there made of the Titanic and the sinking of the Titanic. The old movie, uh, made a long time ago, the, the recent one maybe 20 years ago. But when they made the new movie, I've never even seen the new one, but, they, but when they were making the new movie, when they got to the part when the boat was going down and they, they, they showed how the men were fighting over the lifeboats. And that's not what happened. And so somebody came up to the director and asked them, asked him, why are you showing that the men were fighting over the lifeboats? Because the reality was, the, all the men were in one accord. We'll, get, we'll save the women and the children first, and then the men, whoever can be saved. You know what he said? He said, I, I, I realize that, but if we did that this way, that way, uh, how it really happened in a movie today, our society won't relate to it. When pride comes, then comes shame. What a shameful commentary on our society. Pride brings failure. A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. Well, you can say, well, I know lots of proud people and they got money coming out their ears. You know what? God writes the last chapter. We can go to the Old Testament. Remember Nebuchadnezzar ruled the world, probably the wealthiest country in the world at that time, and everything was built, and he's walking around his palace, look what I have done. And that was enough. And as you walk through Scripture, you see God responding in pr to pride in maybe a more stricter way than anything else almost. Pride. We... Uh, we see it all around us. I've seen people making way into six-figure incomes and they can't rub two dimes together. Pride has consequences. It destroys relationships. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It destroys relationships. I remember I was out in my garden one day and I got a phone call, somebody brought the phone out to me and it was somebody that had been in for counseling. And uh, as I started talking to her on the phone, she was sobbing uncontrollably because of the word, or where her and her husband were at at this point. They had a huge fight. And she says, I can't do this anymore. I hate him. I, I, we just might as well get a divorce. And on and on and on she went. Now I handle it this way because they knew better, okay? So I said to her, when she got calmed down, I said, well, if you were to go to your husband right now and just forgive him for all the things that he's just said to you and whatever the fight's about, and you started to care about what was going on inside him, what would happen? She got really quiet. And she said, 
If I did that, it'd all be solved. I says, yeah, I think so. <laughs> she said, why didn't I think of that? I don't know. And so she got excited. She went from being in the pit of despair with her marriage to, oh, okay, I can do that. And about a couple of days later, I was, walking, I was driving by her place. They were not too far away, and I, I just stopped in. I knew in one few seconds when she opened the door that she had actually done that because there was complete harmony in the home again. When we humble ourselves, relationships work. Well, there are some biblical directives about pride. Well, one more here, he will not tolerate the proud. And that passage there is... Uh, in the New Testament where Herod, the people started praising him and says, you're, you're the voice of a God, not of a man. And he accepted that praise. God turned his heart to a heart of stone. And we see Old Testament and New Testament, God does not tolerate the proud. There are some biblical directives on humility. Never draw attention to your achievements. Let another man praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. We all have things that we can do, but we want to give praise where it is due. Never view yourself more highly than we ought. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think soberly. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Always give God the credit. No flesh should glory in his presence. We all have abilities, and God wires us all differently. And all of that we owe to him. We want to give him the glory for that. And we want to reject or focus on loving others before we get to that one. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Focus on loving others. Here's a question for us. How much time in the past 24 hours did we spend focusing on me or focusing on those around us who we're responsible for that need our help and caring? That's a good question we could all ask ourselves. Reject every thought that exalts itself above God, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We don't understand God with everything. We don't, there's a lot of things we talked about that this weekend. We don't understand everything about God. But we submit to Him. We can't put our mind over the Word of God and think we're going to understand it all. But He's given us everything that we need to understand. And then replace pride with humility. But God gives more grace Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. Well, those are some very pointed things about pride. I'm a very practical kind of person. How does this work in my life? We can pray, oh God, could you just take away all my pride? And you know what? I don't think those kind of prayers work. <laughs> I think we need to get more specific as we talked about dealing with hurts in our past. We could just make a simple prayer, God heal all my past. Well, somehow we have to go back and visit those areas and let God do a work in our heart. Blanket prayers don't really work. So you have, I believe you have one of these sheets. Do they have one of those sheets? Yeah, okay. Identifying pride. And there's basically two kinds of pride. There's obvious pride, focusing on yourself, one's possessions, goals, and achievements. But then there's another kind of hidden pride. Let me illustrate. I know myself the best. When I was 13, 14, I was, I was a tall, skinny kid. I heard every skinny joke, and I became very self-conscious. If I walked into a room, I wouldn't be thinking, well, how are you doing? You know what I'd be thinking? What are you thinking about me? <laughs> That's what I would be thinking. That's a self-focus. That's a self-focus. 
I thought maybe a person like that, who was very self-conscious, would um, be very humble. It's kind of a humble attitude. You know, I walk into a group, I don't want you to look at me, I just want to be here, but don't give me any attention. I thought that was kind of humble. Now I see it as a very proud thing. Because all I'm thinking about is me. It's a self-focus. So two kinds of pride. Want me to keep that in mind. So there's different areas here that I have people check off just to evaluate themselves. Do I have a desire to be recognized and appreciated? Now some of these things on the list here, there's nothing wrong with being recognized and appreciated. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. We should recognize and appreciate others. I've often used this illustration. If I, if I taught a Sunday school class for 40 years straight, never missed a Sunday for 40 years, I just came back by holidays so I could get to my 40 years straight, and then I couldn't do it anymore. And so I just retired. And nobody said anything. Well, if that happened, that wouldn't be a good thing. Somebody should recognize that. But you know, we don't get recognized sometimes. So then, what are we gonna do with it? I could have two responses to that. I could start saying stuff like this. 40 years. Can't believe it. Nobody gives a rip. Or I could say, ah, it's okay. God, you know what I did? My, I want my accolades from you anyway. Let it go. But we should recognize. But it's when that becomes a focus. So check that off if that's a problem for you. Hurt feelings when others are promoted and I'm overlooked. Does that affect me? Focus on myself rather than others. Blaming others for their failures. Becoming defensive when criticized. <laughs> When your wife or your husband criticizes you and you get criticized by your parents, how do you handle that? Concern about what other people think of me. Difficulty in admitting when I have failed another person. Are we able to do that? View of others as lower than myself. Desire for others to meet my needs, do I put myself first? Desire for self-advancement. Desire for success apart from God's blessing or direction. Refusal to give up personal rights. Desire to control others. Talking most often about myself with others. Now here's one that when I was going through this for myself, I, I, I said I don't think I do that. But you know what I did? I started having conversations with people and then I would just try and check myself and I would just kind of step aside in my mind and watch the conversation. And I couldn't believe how much, when they were talking, how much I was thinking about what I was going to say next. So I had to check that one off too. We want to focus on people. Drawing attention to my abilities and achievements. Feeling sorry for myself because I'm not appreciated. Focus on my knowledge and experience. Self-sufficient attitude, excluding God or others. Now if I have a couple in front of me, you notice you have an area to check yourself off, but you also have an area to check your spouse off. Now why do I have that there? Because can people decide for themselves what their problems are? Well, yeah, you can. But in this case of pride, it's a funny thing about pride. The worse a problem pride is in our life, the less we're going to see it. You know, if you got into moral failure, lying or what, you know you did it or you didn't. But you can have, and I can have a pride problem and not really know it. We don't see it. It's an insidious thing. And so I have couples evaluate their spouse. And I always say to, their, to both of them, I say, now if your spouse checks off things for you that you didn't check off for yourself, <laughs> just assume you have it. 
<laughs> if you if you don't accept that, we'll put another one at the bottom. You can't take any direction. <laughs> it's an insidious thing and a hard, hard thing to deal with. I remember one couple came in and uh, they came from the States and she sent me a stack of emails, eight and a half by 11 sheets of all her pain. And it was a horrible life. And I've seen people get hurt so badly, I don't know how they even lived. But she lived in 20 different homes for the first 20 years of her life. Didn't know who her parents were, never met them, didn't know who they were. Every man in her life abused her. It was a horrible story. And so she sent me all that, and I read it, and uh, then I had them do a test, and I realized because of everything she's gone through, I'm in trouble for her coming even in, because uh, I'm a man, first of all, and uh, she was angry at 99%, she was driven, she, was, she would control, just so she wouldn't be hurt anymore. So I knew it was a very delicate thing if I try to lead her, she's going to think I'm controlling her. If I don't agree with her on something, sometimes people like that can ask you a question to see where you land on something, and if you don't agree with what they're saying, they'll feel rejection. So no matter what I do, I'm, I feel like I'm in trouble. So I'm just walking on eggshells. Well, I got into the week and she, she started, all she wanted to do was rehearse all the stories that she sent me and, and talk about them. And as gently as I could, I felt it was time to start resolving things. And I'm almost kind of backing up as I'm talking. <laughs> and I, I said to her, I said, you know, I can see you've got so much pain. I, I, I don't even understand how you pulled through that. I, I don't know how that works. Well, why don't we take some of those issues, let's take them to Jesus and let him bring healing to that so you don't have to carry that anymore. Well, however I said that, and I'm trying to be as kind as I can be, she had a pen in her hand and she winged it at the table, and she looked at me and she said, you're just like all the other men in my life. And she wowed, she took off. And my worst fear happened. The husband totally understood that's what he lives with. And so, I offended her. I knew I could cross a line with her that would turn her away. And so, we were working out of our church at that time, so I went and found her wherever she was in the church, and I sat down with her, and I just apologized to her, and I said, you know what, I was wrong in trying to push you to a place where you just weren't ready to go, I should have been more sensitive to that. Would you choose to forgive me for that? And she did. She forgave me. She wasn't coming back in <laughs> to my office, but she did forgive me. Now, there's a person who is so self-focused on their pain. That's all she can think about. It's a self-focus until she wants to turn and let Jesus do something there. And that is really a big part of that is a pride issue. But I, I, I also admitted that I, I crossed that line. And so I apologized to her and she forgave me. Now an interesting thing happened. Although she didn't come back into the office, when, when she was gone, the uh, husband told me that they have a 22-year-old son and he wanted to get married. And he had a girlfriend, and this is a beautiful girl. The husband told me every father would want this girl for a daughter in law, but mom wouldn't bless it. And the boy was committed to not doing anything until mom blessed the marriage, blessed the relationship. And she wouldn't. No reason, just kind of contrary. And so. It came up again, they went back home. I worked with him the rest of the week, but they went back home and it came up again. And he wanted mom to bless this and finally she says, okay, I'll bless this marriage under one condition. I'll bless it 
before you get married, you get up there to Wingham, Canada, and you sit with that Bramhill guy for a week. Before you get married, then I'll bless it. She always forgive this, and I ask you to humble myself and respond with a proper attitude. Now, I always say this to these people, anybody that comes in and has a pride problem, checked a lot of things off, pray through those things every day for, for 30 days. Now, there's no particular value in repeating a prayer, except in this case, you're going to have those issues. If you pray through that every day for 30 days, those issues are going to come to your mind. So that if you're talking to somebody, it's going to come to your mind. Am I going to be focused on me, or am I going to be focused on them? And you can make a choice. We're getting real practical here now, aren't we? And that really works, and you can start doing, dealing with pride with the little things. And when we deal with the little things, the big thing takes care of itself. So that's one thing I do. Now there's some instruction in the scriptures that says this, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Humble yourselves, and he will lift you up. I'm going to give you two ways this morning how you can humble yourself. Because here's what I found in life. We have pride on both sides of our family. I'll just be honest about that. My grandparents on my mom's side were married for 72 years. When you get married for 72 years, you start getting letters from the Prime Minister. <laughs> That's an accomplishment. They never once celebrated their wedding anniversary. Never once. Most of my aunts and uncles, their children, my mom was one, they all died before they, nobody found out. Well, I think the last one did. Found out when mom and dad were married. And only because my sister and brother-in-law were out east and we knew they were married out there and they went out on business and so she had time to kill so she went into the archives and found out where they were married and when they were married. And then somebody started doing the math and realized that Aunt Vera, the firstborn, came along six months later. They could never square it up. Kids. We didn't do this right. You don't want to go down that road. That has its consequences. But just cover it up, bury it, so that nobody can do the math. That was on my mom's side and my dad's side. Well, I saw a lot of scrapping and bickering. You know, who's going to play the piano the most in the church? Who put the most money into the, into the piano, that kind of thing? Right. So again, I'm talking to myself here. And I've told my kids, this is one area you're going to struggle with. It's in our family. We need to humble ourselves. And I found this. If you humble yourself, that's great. And if you don't humble yourself, God will. <laughs> and I've done it both ways. It's more fun when you humble yourself. If you wait for God to humble us, it's not pretty. Because when God moves into our life and we accept Him as our death substitute and we put our trust in the blood of Jesus for our sin God puts us on his program and he takes us along he takes us along and he's maturing us he never stops and so I heard a really good illustration one time about keeping short accounts with God with this type of thing if you look at the, uh, the uh, continents that we live on they're on platonic plates, they call them, and they're always shifting. Ever so slightly, they're shifting. And where they, where they shift, where the, where the continents meet and so on, they bind. And they, but the pressure keeps coming. And so you have a little bit of an earth tremor, a little bit of an earthquake, and that's a good thing if you get little tremors. But if you go on and on and on in a fault area where these continents are binding and you don't get tremors, the pressure keeps building and building and, and then you have a huge correction and you have a huge earthquake. You know, if we will allow God to work in our lives and deal with the little things, 
humble ourselves as we go along. If we wait for him to put pressure on, it's not, it's not good. So here's two ways that we can humble ourselves. First of all, by living with a clear conscience. In Acts 24, 16, a clear conscience is one that is without offense toward God and toward man. Having a clear conscience, such a vital thing. And in 2 Timothy 1, it says this, Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier. May they help you fight well in the Lord's battles. Cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear for some having deliberately violated their consciences as a result, their faith has become shipwrecked. Here's one way we can humble ourselves. I want to share a struggle I had in this area. When I was in grade 10, I, I took a class in auto mechanics. I can't remember a thing, but I passed the course, but I can't remember how to apply anything about that. Part of the course was we uh, had about 50 jobs over the period of the year to, to do and hand a report in. So the, so you filled out a sheet, you worked in with one of, the, one of your friends, you worked it in pairs, you did this job, change a tire, take a head off an inch, whatever it was, and then you give a report, you hand it in. We had to do 50 of those jobs over the year. Well, my friend, he took some of those blank sheets, filled four or five, six or seven of them out, I don't know how many there were, and we didn't do the job, so he filled it all out, signed my name, signed his name, and handed them in. And then he came and talked to me and said, Grammy, this is what I did, uh, uh, so we don't have to do those jobs. I, I hand them in, so we, we'll be fine with that. I said, you handed things in we didn't do? He says, yeah, that's okay. You don't have to do them in. I says, you know what, I can't do He says, Grammy, it's okay. He just shut me down. It was wrong. I was a Christian. I... That wasn't good. I couldn't, I couldn't do that. And God convicted me about going and talking to the teacher. He convicted me about that. But I didn't want to. I didn't want to embarrass myself. I didn't want to embarrass him. And so I fought with God about that. He wanted me to clear my conscience on that. And I just wouldn't. And then I realized I should, but I just never ever did. And this became a real issue for me. And I had one foot, it felt like I had one foot in the world and I had one foot in the church. And I was straddling the fence because God wasn't, I was disconnected from God in a heart level because I wasn't being obedient. And after a couple of years of that, fighting this ending in my heart all the time, I finally said, okay, God, if this is really of you, because I thought maybe it was maybe coming from Satan now, you, if you don't be obedient, you come up with all kind of wild things. And I, I said to God, okay, if this is really you speaking to me about this, you're sovereign. You put that teacher and myself in a place where we're all alone, and I can just talk to him, then I'll do it. I'll talk. Well, I knew that would never happen. Never happen. So I just relaxed. <laughs> I kind of cleared my conscience that way. And then one day I got off the school bus, walked into the school, and I'm walking down the hall. It was early morning, and here comes this teacher. It's a long hall, and there wasn't anybody I could see. I turned around. Where did everybody go? <laughs> there wasn't a soul around. God spoke to my heart. Okay, I set it up for you. Once you go. And I'd love to tell you that I, I talked to that teacher, but I hardened my heart. I said, not doing that. And I walked on by. And I just refused to do it. I, won't, I can't go into all the details again, but you know what? I got so frustrated with my life from 16 to 19 
And uh, I had him set it up again. I knew he wouldn't do it again, but he did. So then I just, uh, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go to Bible college, and I'm just going to forget about this and move on with my life. So I went to Bible college, and every time I opened my Bible, God would say, so when are you going to go back and deal with that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we won't read the Bible then. And I got to a place at Bible college. I'm staring at the wall laying on my bed, and God felt like he wasn't even real anymore. And I could see all the hypocrisy and all the people around me, all the professors, all the students, a bunch of hypocrites. And my life was close to shipwreck spiritually. In fact, I was there. But God is so gracious. We had chapel every day. And a uh, guy came in to speak. There's maybe a hundred students there. And he spoke right to me. Never saw the guy before. I can't remember who it was. But his whole message was about just being obedient. And just trusting God. And then God really spoke to my heart there. Bob, I don't know where your life is going to go if you don't deal with this. And I made a decision right there. Guess what song we sang when the chapel was over? Trust and obey, for there's no other way. Every time I hear that song, I go back to there and I just realize how gracious God is. So I left school early that week. I went to the school. Pulled the teacher out of the class, showed it to him. And you know what the dumb thing was? It wouldn't have affected my final mark one iota. That wasn't the point. That was a big argument I had. What's the purpose of this? <laughs> and I got free. And God connected with my heart again, and this cloud for four years was gone. Shipwreck. If we don't clear our conscience. You know what? This is a daily thing. Let me tell you one other thing about clearing my conscience. I grew up in a home where you, you felt guilty if you ever slept in. People die in bed, that's why you're old. People die in bed, get out of bed, let's go. You know? So you can never sleep in or relax, okay? And so here I am, I'm pastoring at the time, and we lived out in the country, it was a Saturday morning, so I get to sleep until seven maybe, and, you know, come on. A uh, little bit. So I'm in bed at 7 o'clock in the morning and knock at the door. Wow. I didn't even think about it. You just don't get caught in bed. My goodness, so I jumped out of bed, threw my clothes on, ran down the stairs, opened the door, and we lived out in the country and, and we had old order Mennonites who were um, neighbors and he was there and he wanted to use my phone. So I opened the door and he says, Ah, big beard. Ah, oh, caught you in bed, didn't I? I said, no. <laughs> I couldn't admit that. I didn't plan that. I just, it just kind of came out. <laughs> so he used the phone. And he left. And I go to my picture window. He's walking, the, or he's driving his buggy down the road. And God spoke to me, so you lied to him. Okay, I, I didn't plan that. I, it just came out, kind of like when Aaron, you know, threw the gold into the fire and the calf came out. <laughs> and I argued with God for half an hour. About no, but an hour, I just, I, I'm not, I'm not gonna, that's stupid, doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and then what came to my mind then? four years as a teen and I wouldn't clear my conscience so I said I can't waste another minute on this I get in my car I went over to his place I found him in the barn he was milking a cow and I just said Elias I said you know what I, I just need to come and tell you I lied to you this morning you did catch me in bed and God convicted me about that and I need to be just honest to you Oh, he stood there and he says, Oh, 
Confession's good for the soul. <laughs> Do you know what? I was free. We have to live with a clear conscience. We're getting right down to where we live, aren't we? Now, how does a pastor lie like that? You want to write this one down. By not telling the truth. Simple as that. By not telling the truth. <laughs> That's one way we can clear our conscience. Now, uh, now, you may have some people here as we're talking, and maybe the Spirit of God is saying to you, yeah, there's somebody in this audience right here that you need to go talk to right after the service. You know what I've observed over the years? The biggest problem in churches is when two people have a, an issue and this person doesn't go to this person to resolve it, he goes to all these people. And this one goes to all these people. I had a policy when I was pastoring, if somebody came up to me and they told me, did you hear what Dudu did this said to me? So there's a conflict. I would just say, well, that's okay. Uh, did you want me to show you how to go to the person so you can resolve that? Or did you want me to go with you? Hold on, don't do that. Of course, we have to now. I know there's a problem. Now we gotta solve it. You know what? That's the biggest problem churches have ever. That's the biggest number one problem. Not going to the person and really clearing your conscience. There's another way, that's the first way. So just here's a question to ask yourself. Is there anyone that I need to clear my conscience with? Is there anybody? That's God to speak to. Then there's another way, Matthew 5, 24, 23 and 24. Humble yourself by going to your neighbor. Now we have a responsibility. If we know someone, someone has an issue with us, we need to go to them. If we have an issue with somebody, we have to go to them. If they've offended us somehow, and just talk about it. And most of those things will get cleared up. But whenever you have to make an apology, here's a tremendous way to humble ourselves. Whenever you have to go to make something right with somebody, how you do that will mean everything. And we want to really humble ourselves. And so I, I encourage people this way. When you have someone, something to make right, it could be husband or wife, look them in the eye and say, you know what, I was wrong in that. And state what it was. I was wrong having that attitude, that was just so wrong. That humbles yourself. That makes you, helps you accept responsibility for what you said or what you did. I was wrong. <coughs> and then you want to express sorrow. I am sorry. I, I, I can't take the words back, but I am sorry. And communicate your heart to the person. And then don't assume forgiveness. Would you choose to forgive me? Sometimes we just do things like, yeah, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have done that. <coughs> Sorry. And this is a real critical thing because sometimes a wife or the other way will really deeply offend the other person. And if you handle apologies that way, it doesn't get to their heart. Because they know you're not really owning it. You're not serious about it. You don't see the hurt you caused. Would you choose to forgive me? And let them answer. That brings the whole thing to conclusion. And then you can put it away. These are not new things to you. They are just so, so powerful. I remember the first time I, I, I did this seminar, this would be years ago. I had about 50 couples in the audience. And uh, we were just going to have dinner, so we were just talking about this whole pride issue. And I says, let's, let's just do something practical here. So I had all the husbands and wives. I says, I just want you husbands to just take your wife's hands, look her in the eye, 
and I just want you to say the words. We're not talking about any issues right now. We don't want anything breaking out. So just, you're just going to practice the words. I was wrong. I am sorry. Would you choose to forget? Just practice the words. Never forget what happened. <laughs> well, lots of guys, they, oh, they were looking for stuff in their pocket. <laughs> They weren't going to do that. And another group, um, well, the first, the first, about a third of them, I would say, just did it. And then the next group, they've got something else to do here, but they weren't going to do it. And then this other third of the group just stared at me. <laughs> Make me. And it was kind of shocking. But I realized how hard this can be. What we're dealing with is our pride. To really humble ourselves. You know, we have... Uh, our pastor just resigned, but uh, he was there for 12 years. And he was there for about six months, and I, I re uh, resigned from pastoring, and I stayed in the same church. But one Sunday morning, about six months in, he was speaking, and uh, he, he made an offhanded comment, and I could, it was kind of a proud statement, and I could just feel half the congregation just bristle. Don't say. And I sat there and I thought, should I talk to him after about this? Because he just set half the congregation off. And I got talking to people, he got talking to people, and I, I didn't. And so... Next Sunday came around, and he got up to speak. And he says, before I get into my message, there's something I want to clear up from last week. He said, when I made this statement, somebody came up to me right after and said how offended they were by that. And he says, I realized right away how wrong that was to say that. It was just a proud statement. And, I, and he apologized. He says, I, 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 was, I should never have said that. And I'm asking you as a congregation if you would just forgive me for that. And you know what? That never was talked about. That whole thing was settled and everybody that bristled the week before just relaxed. I think it was so critical. In fact, after that meeting, I went up to him and I commended him for doing that. He just humbled himself. And if he hadn't, if he could have justified it somehow, his ministry would have taken a different direction. So this is so, so critical. Sometimes we don't want to talk to somebody because we don't think they're going to accept it. They don't, they, you can't talk to them. Well, you know what? I offended a guy so deeply once in our church. It was, we were just in the foyer, and uh, he had come to our church, didn't join our church, but in the time that he was just visiting there, he came out of a, a, an abusive church. He really was a real thinker and a theological reader, and his theology was going in a different direction there where we were at. I wouldn't say it's heresy or anything, but just not where we were at. And so I said to him in the foyer, I says, maybe it's time, I'll call him Jim, Jim to uh, maybe move on and find a church where you can really get involved. And, and I'm, I'm just talking. And we were good friends. Well, he took that as absolute rejection and he got so angry at me and he took a strip down one side, up the other side and ran out the door, slammed the door. Just right in the foyer, everybody's still there. And I stood there and I thought, Bob, do you learn anything? You knew he was coming out of another church that was so abusive to him and you just pushed all those buttons. And I had to make it right with him. But I couldn't go to his place. He had a German shepherd, literally. <laughs> no. I didn't want to write a letter because those things don't get solved by letters. I thought the only thing I could do was really call him. And it was before the days we have cell phones and everything. And so he probably wouldn't see my name. If he saw my name, he'd forget it. So I just called him up. Luckily, he answered the phone. And I had written out what I wanted to say. I didn't want to blow it again. And I, I said, Jim, I was so wrong. 
in saying what I said to you. And I am sorry. I, I, I can't take those words back, but I should never have put you in that place, and I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Would you choose to forgive me for that? And he did. And we're still good friends. But he did move on. He found another church, and we still see each other periodically. It takes a pretty tough cookie not to accept an apology when you walk through those three things and you let your heart go to their heart, they will accept that. They will accept that. So we're told to humble ourselves. Well, that's a little bit about this whole thing of pride. And it affects every one of us to one degree or another. But I do also realize it's, it's the hardest thing to deal with in counseling. Let's pray and ask God to work in each one of our hearts. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you gave us the greatest example, the greatest example of humbling ourselves when you left heaven and you came to this earth and you allowed what you created to spit on you. You humbled yourself to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And now you're exalted high above. King of kings and Lord of lords, that's where you're going to be forever. And Father, you've told us, humble ourselves. And so, would you just put a finger on something right now in our hearts? Something that I may need to deal with. Someone, something that someone has to deal with here, just to clear their conscience to make something right with someone. And we thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being a perfect gentleman. You don't push us, but you do lead us. So we give ourselves to you, and we ask you to work in this very area. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. I just want to say thank you so much for having us here this weekend. It's been a joy and a pleasure to be here. And I just ask God to bless all of you.